for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Tim Matthews. Tim is the CMO of Exabeam, a cybersecurity and software player in the cybersecurity space. I'm also having Tim on because he's the author of a great guidebook or um, handbook, as he would call it, called The Professional Marketer. So today we talk a little, a little bit about his path, why he wrote this book. It was a few years back. And what he's looking for in marketers as he hires his own team and the power of curiosity as marketers. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Tim Matthews. Well, Tim, would you introduce yourself? Sure. This is Tim Matthews. I am CMO of a security software company called Exabeam and author of The Professional Marketer. Perfect. Well, Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Let's. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about, but let's start off with uh, what's been your path to uh, CMO at Exabeam? So my degree for, out of college was a computer science degree, but I realized I didn't want to be a developer after I graduated. So I hung up my compiler <laughs> and changed it out for PowerPoint and became what I thought was the next best thing, which is a system engineer supporting a sales team at a software company. So having been in the field for a couple of years in sales as an SE, I saw what I thought was some not so great marketing from headquarters, I was out in the field. And I jokingly said to folks that uh, I was the victim of bad marketing. And so I thought I could do it better myself. So long story short, a CMO at a company gave me a shot to join his team. And I thought, you know, what better way than to join a marketing team and do the marketing across 50 salespeople, not you know, do my own marketing in the field myself. So that's how I got into marketing. Got it. Well, so programmer or engineer to sales to marketing because of the gap that you saw? Yes. I had the ability to break down technical issues and simplify them, which I thought was a really good skill to have as part of a sales team. And then, of course, I realized I could then just scale that into marketing. And I do believe that a good marketers really understand their products and their buyers. So having mm -hmm. that technical background in what I do, which is you know software marketing, I thought it's been really helpful. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. And I know, I think in a prior conversation, you mentioned to me that your sales experience in particular was kind of pivotal, obviously, for you going into marketing because you saw the gaps and things that you needed that you didn't have from a marketing a standpoint. Absolutely. And, and not only that, but you really don't understand your business until you witness a sale. And whatever, whatever you do, whether it's you know, retail marketing or as I do, B2B marketing, if you're not there where the rubber meets the road, you know, a deal is done or a deal is not done, equally instructive, you don't really understand what your sales team or your distribution channel or your retailer partners or whoever it happens to be faces. And you don't really have that, not just understanding, but credibility with your sellers. So I think it's a great experience to understand how your business works, which I think makes for a better marketer. That's a great point. And I, I don't, it, would you agree with the statement that having some sort of sales experience as a marketer is a missing link if you don't have it? I think so. Said another way, I'm always surprised how many marketers have never actually met their customer or buyer. Uh, Just think about that for a second. Yeah. You're supposed to be the person in charge of your go-to-market strategy and you've never actually met the person who's doing the buying. And it's not enough just to read a survey. Uh, you really need to understand what those people are up to, what they think. So I think sales experience is a great way. If you don't have that opportunity, figure out a way you can get out into the field. Go to your retailer, go to a customer, at least go to a trade show and figure out what makes your buyers tick. It'll make you such a better marketer. Hmm. Well, um, you've, if, if we flash forward now um, a number of years, you went from needing better marketing to being a marketer so that you could provide that, you know, fill that gap. And now you've, in the last number of years, you've written the book on marketing, The Professional Marketer. What, that is true. <laughs> what drove you to write the book? 
I was looking for a handbook that could teach marketers the critical skills they needed to do the job. This came to light for me after running a few marketing teams and just seeing the gaps. People would tend to specialize in their particular area of marketing. So whether it's public relations or demand generation or product marketing. And I saw that a lot of people who were very good at those single disciplines didn't have a broader view and didn't have the really crucial skills to get those jobs done. So I went looking for a book and what I found were really two kinds of books, academic textbooks, which I thought were fairly useless for on, you know, hands-on pragmatic marketing tasks mm-hmm. or single text or single topic texts, I should say, that are great. I mean, Ogilvy and Advertising, Crossing the Chasm, there's all kinds of great books, but there really wasn't that handbook. So having looked for it and having been unable to find it, I decided to write it, which is both the smartest thing and the dumbest thing I ever did, but I'm, I'm, I am happy I did it. Well, yeah. well, and it is truly a handbook. Like it's a, it's one of those uh, for listeners it, 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 that you, you would reach for from time to time because you don't do everything in marketing every day. That's right. And, and I, I've, I've enjoyed kind of thumbing through it and going to a specific chapter because, Hey, I, I need to, uh, I need to write a press release today. <laughs> like what, I, I, I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what do I need to remember? That's exactly how I intended it, where you would be needing to write a messaging platform or create a marketing budget or mm-hmm. a marketing org chart or all these tasks that we were called on to do from time to time. And I actually was inspired by my wife. She used to be a professional chef and their mm-hmm. handbook that they learned from uh, is called The Professional Chef at the Culinary Institute of America. And the idea behind that book is they don't teach you recipes. Uh, And in the same way, I'm not going to teach you literally how to do your marketing for your business because I don't know your business, but I'll teach you the fundamental skills. So professional chefs learn the mother sauces, the cooking techniques, and they put it all together because they have that skill set. And that was the same idea I had where I'm going to give you all the fundamental building blocks and you put them together if you're a retail marketer or a B2B software marketer or services marketer, you, you take and put them together the way that makes, makes most sense to you, but I'll give you the fundamentals. I love that. That's a great analogy too. Well, what was the experience of writing the handbook for professional marketers? I've thought, I've honestly thought about writing a book, but it scares the bejesus out of me. So what was that like? First of all, I would encourage anybody who is thinking about writing a book to write a book. Start with the first page and then move to the first chapter, and before you know it, you have three chapters, and just keep on going. And it's it really is something that just takes dedication. I'll tell you that it's a very humbling experience. I, when I wrote the book or began writing it, I think I'd had something like 15 years of marketing experience. So I thought I knew what I was talking about. But when you have to teach something, and in particular write something down in a way that's going to make sense to a total stranger, it's very humbling because you see all the gaps. So for example... I'm really not an advertising guy, so the chapter on advertising was a bit challenging for me because I didn't literally have all the experience. I've never done a TV commercial, Mm -hmm. for example. How how do you do that? Right. So it was very humbling to begin with, which is is great because I actually learned a lot of things from uh, reading the book. And I also was able to learn myself and fill in some of my own gaps. The other thing that happened was the, the editing which was unexpected. So it took me about a year and a half to write the first draft. You know, it wasn't full-time. It was nights and weekends. It took me about a year right. to edit the book. And probably any author you talk to will tell you that, you know, you don't write the book once. You write it three, four, maybe even five times. So there's a lot of work that goes in after the initial writing, which I don't want to discourage people because I will say that the first draft wasn't great. And I'm really pleased with, I think, what ended up being the fifth draft of the book. I love it. I, I've met a couple authors recently. One been on the podcast, a New York Times bestselling guy, Cal Fussman. I spent some time this week with him actually, mm-hmm. and he 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 has this saying that writing is editing, <laughs> which I, sounds 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 to be true. I totally agree, and I I'll say that behind every great writer is a great editor, and yeah. people yeah. shouldn't be afraid of editing because it will make right. you look a lot smarter and better. Right, right, right. Well, well, and, and kudos for you doing it nights and weekends and, and making it come to fruition. That that 
by itself shows kind of the dedication that you have as a, as a person. So, right. I'm also the kind of guy that just can't not do something I say I'm going to do. So I uh, right. kind of got myself into it. It's my own fault. <laughs> you signed <laughs> yourself up for it. I you you got to complete it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So. Well, uh, well, getting back to your day job as a CMO, it's, it's a tight labor market today. Um, and it seems to be getting tighter as the market improves. How are you? How are you focused on hiring good marketing people? You wrote this book for for people so they can be more generalist, uh, or or at least have a reference to do that. But how are you thinking about the people themselves? It is a super tight market, and I I can't believe. Seems like salaries go up year over year. I'm always surprised at what people are asking for for different for different jobs. I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. You know, one is. I've certainly become more open-minded about hiring people remotely Mm -hmm. and hiring people in different regions. In fact, uh, Exaveam has set up a satellite office in Atlanta to attract talent. And it's not just marketing talent, it's talent in all different areas. I think we're realizing that we just can't continue to recruit in the same narrow peninsula here in Silicon Valley. There's just so many companies uh, who are paying really well. I mean, it's hard now because you've got the, the behemoths, the big five, like Apple, Google, Facebook, who are paying top dollar and have very valuable stock options, which in, in tech is a big part of the incentive package. Right. And then you have startups that are very well funded who have raised, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. So people are paying a lot of money. So it's not like it used to be go to a startup and take a take a pay hit uh, or go to an established company and be paid a full salary. Now it's like you can have your cake and eat it too. The other thing I've done is really look for fundamental skills in people. I think that you can build a good marketer, especially, uh, I think, having written the book, I know what I need to teach people. But I look for some fundamental just people skills. So when I interview now, it's not just about, you know, for example, have you written a press release or tell me about, you know, your demand gen programs. But I want to know about their personal personality traits, things like curiosity, exactitude, yeah. things like drive and commitment. You know, these days in marketing, it's like constant improvement, constant optimization, for example. So I want somebody who doesn't want to just finish a project and be done with it. I want somebody who just wants to perfect it over time. So I look for, for example, somebody, are you a, an endurance athlete? They might be really good at marketing because they're dedicated and they've got the drive and commitment to see things through. Is somebody really detail oriented? Um, that would be, that might be really good for demand gen where you're looking at you know, small increases in conversion rates over time. So I encourage marketers to be a bit more open-minded. And when we do our interviews here, I typically will give assignments to the interview team. And some of those assignments are about personality traits that we're looking mm-hmm. for to see if they're the right fit. Got it. Well, and you mentioned curiosity. How, tell me a little bit more about that trait. Like, what are you, you know, what are you looking for? What do you feel like that curiosity demonstrates? And then maybe how, how do you assess that? It seems like it'd be a hard one to assess. It can be. I'll give you two examples. So in marketing, a lot of us do uh, buyer persona research. We're trying to understand, you know, what drives our buyer. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to do with really getting to know your buyer and understanding his or her, her his or her motivation. So a couple of jobs ago, we were selling to the head of security and we would do on the phone or in-person interviews. And we just ask them about what, what is your day like? What is your job like? What are your challenges? Things like that. Now, our assumption had been that the head of security was concerned about keeping their company secure, right? It seems logical, right? So all of our marketing had been around how to make your company more secure. What we found out, however, was that these executives felt like junior executives. They felt like they weren't really C-level executives. The title is Chief Information Security Officer. And we talked to a number of them who said, I want some kind of metrics or reports that I can use to bring value to the business in the boardroom. And that was a really interesting insight and a very powerful insight. And we changed up our marketing. So we uh, ended up providing a lot more tools and reports around corporate risk, corporate risk management, uh, things like that, that we could arm our buyer with so they could achieve their career aspirations. And if we had not had that curiosity to go out and ask a whole bunch of questions to a number of CISOs, as they're called, 
We never would have figured that out. So having the curiosity to sit down and talk to and ask your buyers about what their days, their lives, their personal lives, I think is really important. So that's, that's one example. The second example has to do with optimization. So there's a discipline in marketing now called conversion rate optimization or CRO. And this is all about how you make your website more efficient in converting leads. And it's typically practiced by software vendors or SaaS vendors, but there are lots of e-commerce sites, for example, that will really spend a lot of time and dedicate a lot of resources, maybe even a whole team that looks at how they present the goods on the site. And Amazon, for example, is a master at this. Well, to, to do that well, you've got to be good at experimentation and you've got to be figuring out ways that people might be buying better or faster or buying more. And so I'll give you an example. So we had a button on our site, a call to action, as we call it, that said contact sales. Very common. You see this on a lot of websites. And we did an experiment where we changed contact sales to get quote. And that one change of those two words increased our conversions by 300%. Huge wow. increase for us. Because when you think about it, nobody really wants to talk to a salesperson in any, in any business. <laughs> what they really want to know is, how much does it cost and can I afford it? Right. So changing contact sales to get quote, cut through what they didn't want to deal with right to what they wanted, which was to get the price. Now, as it turns out, they're going to talk to a sales guy anyway, but they didn't know that. But having the curiosity to figure out different ways to optimize the experience online or on a mobile device, I think is also really critical and can be worth a lot of money to a business. I like that. I like that. I may use that one actually later today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go for it. You never know. Yeah. I at least test it. Let's see what it does for the one, the and client. I guess. Honestly, I, around this area of CRO, I was talking to a guy who we work with in this area and I, said, I call Sarah the, the end of opinion or the death of opinion, because sometimes <laughs> the ugly page or the ugly button or the ugly color works better than what right. the CMO prefers or what the CEO right. prefers. So it's kind of fun in a way to have the data to be able to provide the answers that are irrefutable. I love it. Love it. Well, uh, let's assume now we've got this good talent base or this good team. How do you you're in the software space, you know, how do you, how do you set the pace for the marketing team? Yeah. And especially for us, we are an upstart trying to take right. out some larger companies. So, you know, we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. We have no laurels to rest on yet. Right. We're, we're building those. <laughs> so it's a balance between driving people hard, which you need to do. But as we talked about earlier, it is a tight labor market. So you cannot burn people out because mm -hmm. there are plenty of good offers out there. So you need to really set the proper, I'd like to think of it as cadence for the team. So we do a couple of different things. You know, one is we do what I call semi-agile marketing. So for those who understand agile software development, it's, you know, daily standups, scrums with very short-term mm -hmm. goals to move forward as opposed to half year long or year long goals. So we take our marketing plan, we divide it up into 12 months and we have discrete objectives that need to get done within the month, typically three to five per person. And in our weekly meetings, we discuss those and really focus on obviously achievement, but also are there any blockers, things that are keeping you or people that are keeping you from getting things done? Mm -hmm. uh, how can I help you as a CMO? How can the team help you? So that's one way that we, that we move forward in a, in a way that breaks down these big tasks into more digestible chunks that are more achievable. And that gives people a sense of satisfaction. I don't know about you, but I'm a, a big lister. I've got a pad here with a list of things. I think the team likes people to, to cross yeah. stuff off their list and feel like they're getting stuff done. The other thing we do is we don't right. beat somebody up if there's a failure. If they try something, say an experiment, for example, on the website doesn't work, that's still valuable work. You know, we don't beat them up for not having success. Of course, we want success over time, but you know, we can't allow that to stop us from moving forward and, and bum people out. The last one is I always review the annual marketing plan yeah. on a quarterly basis. This is a way to show people that we're not only getting all these small tasks done, but we're, we're moving toward our larger goals for the year. And there was a time when I didn't do that. And one of my employees told me that they just weren't sure we were making any headway. 
And I was almost incredulous. I thought, well, how can that be? I mean, we're making tremendous progress, but they just didn't see it because they were down in their particular area and they weren't seeing the bigger overall success. So it's really important. I, I've learned to share the, the big picture of your team on a, on a regular basis yeah. so they can see the progress. And it's not just yet more work being assigned to them by the CMO. No, I, I, I love those three things in particular. I mean, the last one, that context many times is missing in a lot of organizations. Um, yeah, you, you forget that, you know, these people are not sitting in the executive meetings or the board meetings. Right. They're not meeting with your leadership team. They don't necessarily understand. And uh, how could they? And you just forget that. Right, right. For, well, yeah, for sure. And the the notion that you, you I like your semi-agile marketing approach, too, uh, because... I mean, there are a lot of companies out there that are successful with adopting Agile, out, so quote unquote, out of the box um, for their organizations. But the two week sprints just seem and sometimes just it's too short for marketers, I, I think, to make progress. Yep. And uh, so making a month makes sense. But you've got three to five things per person that they're working on during that period of time, too. So you've yeah, got I, this nice mix. I agree. I mean, getting something done in a week is launching a, a, a product, for example, or. Right, a big PR campaign. It's just not doable in a week. No, and and it, I think it's the nature of the marketing function. I don't, you could disagree with me, but like we are integrating with so many other functions that there's just a natural period of um, connectivity conversations that have to happen yeah. to get movement. That you That's right. that if you were you know getting your spec or your your story to go build. A, a, some code, you know, there's probably not the need to go back and forth as much. Yeah, it's a really interesting way to put it. Software developers are integrating with code that already exists. Right. We're integrating with people. Yeah. Right. right. Here, people it just takes time naturally to communicate. Right. Right. The code doesn't necessarily talk back. I mean, you, you, <laughs> you yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, some software engineers might disagree, and I get the whole, you know, introdu introducing bugs that you didn't realize were gonna were gonna occur. Right. But for the most part, it's not a human talking back to you. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, well, this has been this has been great. I love to get to know the person behind um, this conversation too. But before we do that, I just realized, tell listeners what Exabeam does. Um, I don't think we've covered that. So. Exabeam is in the security management space. So to use an analogy, we follow a cybercrime from start to finish. And if you think about a criminal breaking into a business, for example, there's the breaking the window, there's the breaking a lock or stealing a badge, all the way through to you know, rummaging through a filing cabinet and making a getaway. A lot of times criminals do the same thing on the online, in the online world where they'll infect the machine with malware or from a phishing attack, they'll steal a password, They'll find the sensitive data on a server, customer names, credit card numbers, software design, whatever it happens to be, and move that off somewhere into their own computers right in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So tracking that across all those different points is very difficult. So what we do is we put it all together into a timeline that shows the start and the finish of an attack, and hopefully we'll catch them while they're in the midst of their attack. And if you think about these days, all of your workers on all their different devices, different locations, using all these different cloud applications. It's very complicated. So we yeah. use machine learning analytics to put together those timelines to help security teams to get rid of the noise and focus on the most pressing problems. Uh, that's important work. It's especially, I mean, there's so many, um, there's so much more data and so much more distribution of that data that you, I think, just naturally are going to see more and more of these risk. Um, and That's right. And, and uh, you know, another market with a labor shortage is the uh, cybersecurity market. Yeah. Uh, I should say people who do that as their profession. Right. It's hard to find people. Number one, there's actually significant labor shortage here in the U.S. And there's significant burnout. Mm. So we feel we can fill a gap with machine learning yeah. where people can have more fulfilling jobs, hopefully not work weekends. Uh, and help companies fill their their labor pools. That's great. That's great. Well, um, well, let's get to know you a little bit. Um, I, I love this question. You know, is there an experience in your past that defines or makes up who you are today? So I think there are two in particular that come to mind. One is I spent several summers doing menial labor uh, during college breaks. So spent one summer 
scraping and painting chemical tanks at a pharmaceutical company. <laughs> and that is just, was, I, I can still feel the heat. <laughs> Usually these tanks are set in a big asphalt field and they're of course made out of metal. Oh. It's middle of the summer yeah. and you're scraping and painting them. And that was just pretty hard work. And then I had another summer job where I worked for the Department of Public Works in my hometown. So I did things like spraying pesticide and cleaning out clogged drains and things like that. And I think that those experiences, nothing wrong with those jobs, but it, it gave me humility. And I realized that there are a lot of really hard jobs out there and it takes a lot of work. Uh, I did those jobs, but I didn't really want to do them forever. Right. So that was, that was probably one big one. And, you know, then I, then I also do think that my time in sales was really formative for me. Uh, not just because I understood the buyer, but, you know, there are times when I was yelled at by customers. I was, I had customers roll their eyes at me. You know, <laughs> you really, you really see how people view your company or product when you're out there on the front lines. So I think that made me realize that I also had to have some humility about my product and my business. And I had to really put it in the context that the buyer would appreciate. So I think those two really, for me, stand out. Uh, as, as things that formed me. Mm-hmm. And I also know that if all this fails, I can go back to scraping chemical tanks and <laughs> make a, some, somewhat of a living. I'm not yeah. about that. <laughs> right, right. I, it's funny you brought that up because as soon as you started to describe it, I started to remember I had a similar type of summer jobs. I was building concrete swimming pools one summer. And there is nothing that will destroy your skin more in life than touching con- wet concrete. Um, <laughs> it just sucks all the moisture out of your skin. And, uh, anyway, it, I, and it was hot. So it's, um, yeah. I, I, that's anyway, those are, those are memories you cannot forget. That's for sure. You can't. And it, and it, when we think you've had a bad day, yeah, I can't, you know? it's not that bad. <laughs> I, I, and I work, I work for a couple CEOs and GMs who've been in the military and have been in combat. Yeah. And they would always tell me kind of jokingly, what's the board going to do? Yell at me. Right. People have been right. shooting at me before. So right. this is nothing. <laughs> That's very true. We're definitely very hardened true. by our own experiences. Yeah. Well, um, what advice would you give your younger self if you're starting all over again? So first off, I'd say I'm pretty happy where I ended up. You know, it's hard to yeah. look back in your life if you're fairly happy with where you are and, and wonder what you might change. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that being said, you know, I, I did have a job or two, or maybe I stayed a bit too long, where you know I'm, I'm a bit of a soft-hearted marketer. I tend to fall in love with my products technology. And in a couple jobs, one in particular where I was a founder, it just wasn't working. And nowadays, people talk about failing fast. So I think I probably could have failed faster in at least one of my previous jobs, if not two. where I And that's a situation where I was not heating the buyer signals, or in, the, or in this case, the non-buying signals of customers. Uh, and, and I was trying to pivot and reposition. And it fundamentally wasn't the right product to go back to the four P's of marketing uh, in that one situation. So I do think that, you know, you're never stuck in a job. There's always opportunity elsewhere, as painful as it might be to leave something, especially as a founder. But I, I do think failing fast, and I don't mean like three months, like some people talk about now, but give it a bit of time. And if it's just not working, might be time to move on. Right. Well, what, uh, what fuels you? What keeps you going today? I'm a very competitive person. You know, I'm not the guy you know who's beating little kids in tennis or volleyball. <laughs> right. I'm not, not. I'm not that. Not that competitive. Right. But I do think of marketing uh, and the market as a competition. We're all vying for some piece of the total addressable market of TAM, and I want as big a piece of that as possible. So I do quite often look at my competition and I think of it that way. I think of my, the CMOs at my competition as my adversaries. Mm -hmm. And I look at our salespeople uh, as our athletes and how do we, how do we, you know, get more than our fair share of that TAM. And I look, by the way, when I do competitive analysis, not just at the product, but at our go to market, at our advertising, at our messaging. Uh, and I actually have my teams do this from time to time, just do a, do a couple days and take a look at the competition. So 
that really fuels me. Uh, you know, every big deal, every million dollars, every $10 million that we, that we win mm. in the market, I find very fulfilling. Now, not to sound cold hearted, uh, you know, I think what we do is really important. So I think that making companies better able to deal with the security issues is an important cause. I do believe in the cause, mm-hmm. but within that cause, so to speak, I want to be the most important company. Right. That makes sense. Well, um, I, I tend to think of marketers as, and I think you've demonstrated this through this conversation, your students of the business, right? Or the function of marketing. Yeah. And I'm curious if there's companies or brands or causes that you you're taking notice of or, or monitoring or you think others should um, should think about. Can I give you a couple examples? Yeah, Great. yeah, absolutely. So one that I love is Chipotle, the, uh, mm-hmm. the what's called a quick service Mexican restaurant. Yep. I love it for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I've actually listened to the founder before being interviewed. You know, he went into, you know, talk about a commoditized market. Uh, at least in California, there must be thousands, if not tens of thousands of Mexican restaurants. But he went into a right. really saturated competitive market and was able to differentiate his company and establish a really strong brand with a real brand personality. So that's one company I really admire and I drive past their billboards. So I see them uh, probably pretty much every day and I do eat there. <laughs> so that's one I really like. Yeah. I really like Tesla. Yeah. Tesla for a couple of reasons. One is go back to the four piece of marketing. It's all about product, an amazing product. Somebody who, despite his, uh, fairly recent, less conventional self. Right. But overall, you know, Elon Musk went against the grain and started a car company, which no one's done in I don't know how long. Right. And he also did a couple of things which I which I as a marketer thought was a mistake or mistakes and was successful. So I don't know if you remember when the New York Times reviewed one of the early Teslas and uh, kind of slammed the Tesla car for its uh, poor battery performance. Mm. And he went on social media and challenged the data and challenged the reporter directly, which I thought was a big no-no. Like never challenged the, right. the press, you know, especially not the New York Times, you know, the the uh, irreproachable New York Times. Right. But he did it, and he won over public opinion with data. So he was able to really get out there and use this new medium to further his company's cause. <laughs> um, the last one which I think is interesting is, I don't know if you've heard of this co- group called the Ocean Cleanup. I, I may have. I they, may have, uh, yeah. So it's, it's an organization that is creating this floating yes. U-shaped, yeah. kind of like a big squeegee, so to speak, to collect plastic yeah. in the big ocean plastic patches in the, that are out there. And uh, it's a very noble cause. You know, we, as you may know, we have tons of plastic that's polluting the ocean and breaking down and causing issues not only for fish, but eventually it comes back to us in the food, food chain as these fish eat these microscopic pellets of plastic. And the reason I like them is because they are a great example of using social media to reach their audience, which is people concerned about healthier planet, healthier lifestyle, uh, and of course, a good cause. And, you know, this thing is floating, or it's now currently being repaired, but it's floating out in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere. And they do a great job of using Twitter and Instagram to send updates, send pictures, uh, to keep their audience engaged for something that's just, you know, literally thousands of miles away. So those are, those are just a couple of examples. I love working in marketing because you get to see all these different examples and not only be a student, but be a critic yeah. of good and bad marketing. It's kind of fun. For sure. For sure. Those are three great examples. Well, last question for you. What do you believe the future of marketing looks like? First of all, I think it's exciting. There's so much going on. It's really stimulating. The pace of change marketing is so fast right now. It's, uh, I often talk to my fellow CMOs and we talk about the need to keep up because things change so quickly. But there's a couple areas I'm pretty excited about. One is just more and more data. And you know, I'm not talking about ill-gotten data right. like Facebook's right. being accused of, of using, but um, talking about just data about your customers, about their interactions with your website, how they view your brand. It used to be that you had to make arguments based on opinion in marketing mm. or based on your personal beliefs. And now it's 
based on data. And you, like I said, topic earlier with that CRO example, you have objective data about your customers. So that's one really exciting thing. We always want to know more about what drives our customers. And so that's, I think, only going to get better and better for us. Related to that, there are more and more ways now to hear directly from your customers. So I talked about getting to know your customers and it used to be you had to maybe call a focus group, which tend to be fairly expensive. You had to fly somewhere, sit behind a pane of glass, mm-hmm. watching customers answer questions. You know, now you can do most of this stuff online uh, and you can hear directly from customers in all kinds of ways, surveys, social media, of course, there are some great tools that allow folks to give you feedback directly about your website. So there's just a lot more information available to you as a marketer. And you can ask questions directly to your buyers, which used to be fairly difficult. And now it's pretty, pretty easy. So that's another thing I think is pretty exciting. The last thing is I think marketing is going to continue to carry more of the load. And what I mean by that is think about the changes that have happened in e-commerce, for example, and you're now talking directly or buying directly from the retailer and that e-commerce VP and the people building that website are the ones who are driving the business in the enterprise space. For me, it's all about trying to get as much information to the buyer as soon as possible. So he doesn't have to rely on a channel partner or a sales rep and nothing against channel partners or sales reps, but I think people now would prefer to buy on their own. And if you can, as a marketer, provide all the information, they need, all the content, all the whatever it is, the selection guides, the configuration guides, you, know, you can build your own cars now online, whatever you can do to bring the buyer that much closer to a deal, I think is great for the business. Sales guys like it because if they do get paid on those deals, there's less for them to do. But I think marketing now, and, and Forrester and others have talked about this, that uh, depending on who you listen to, between 50 and 75% of the buying cycle is actually now done before someone ever talks to a salesperson. That's for enterprise sales. So with, on online, it's obviously typically 100%. But that's really exciting because now marketers are really driving the business, not just throwing a great party or making a nice billboard or you know creating a great press release. So I'm excited about all those things in marketing. That's a, it's phenomenal. And I, I, I love, I do, I agree. I think marketers are going to carry more of the load and, um, or marketing as a function will. Yep. And that stat, I it was recently at the Adobe Summit, and which is now merged with Marketo, and there was a lot of conversation about that exact topic of you know how much buying activity happens before you even make contact with That's people. Right. So, so I think it's a great time to be a marketer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, Tim, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, it's been fun. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. and You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.